Hello everyone, Calablade here, and welcome back to Calavlogs. Today I wanted to look at my computer game collection. Now most of these games uh, aren't very recent. I haven't collected games to actually play on the computer in a long time. Although I've been getting really nostalgic lately about computer games, specifically a lot of retro and old school ones, although some of the ones I have here you'll see aren't necessarily either retro or old school, but I have quite a few in here from the DOS days, and some actually, technically from even before, and I've been feeling uh, just kinda, you know, nostalgic and retrospective about this stuff, and wanted to uh, go through it with you guys if you're interested, so let's take a look at some of my computer games. Now these are in no particular order. Some of these I actually haven't even played yet, either because I've never been able to get them to run or I simply just haven't gotten around to it. I'll find a lot of these at thrift stores. Uh, you can actually find a lot of old computer games in thrift stores mixed in with music CDs and whatnot. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would definitely recommend checking that sort of place. So, alrighty. We're going to start off with, I think, the King's Quest series and just some of the Sierra games that I have here. So, this is actually uh, the insert to King's Quest 7, which was the first of the King's Quest series I ever owned or bought personally with my own money. I think I was 8 years old or so, got it with my allowance. I don't actually have the original box or anything. In fact, the disc that's in here is from the King's Quest collection from the 1997, which is basically just a, a compilation of all the games. But uh, I still have the original insert to the CD-ROM for my copy of King's Quest 7, although the original disc I had given away to a friend, I believe, when I got this version. I wouldn't mind getting that again, though, especially in the box. And this is uh, disc 1 to that King's Quest collection, which is the first seven games in the series. And yes, I'm aware that in my last vlog I made a King's Quest mistake and said that the character Mordak was from King's Quest 3. I know very much so that he is from King's Quest 5. Uh, King's Quest 3 was his brother, the evil wizard Mananan. Mananan. Mananana. Anyways, sorry. And this is King's Quest 6. Found this at the thrift store. Couldn't resist. It was only a dollar. Whoop. Bumping my tripod here. <laughs> Anyways, it's my probably most favorite computer game of all time. I would say even more than Warcraft 2, admittedly, in terms of how much I love it, and this is really what started me playing computer games rather than regular or Super NES Nintendo. And I own a few copies of King's Quest VI, technically, although I've been taking an interest thanks to, uh, thanks to LGR, who's an internet reviewer who sort of specializes in DOS PC games, among other things has gotten me interested in getting more big boxes, such as this right here, which I just want to look at. Um, this is Shadows of Darkness, which is the fourth game in the Quest for Glory series. Got this for $2 at a thrift store. I mean, you can sometimes get really lucky like that, but it's just super awesome. I love these things. They make me feel super nostalgic, much more than the small boxes, so I definitely have to agree with those who feel the same. And it came with uh, most of the stuff, too. I mean, I've got the... CD-ROM. It doesn't have the insert, but we've got the two manuals, the uh, technical guide, and the, uh, they always have these in the Quest for Glory ones. Um, it's like a magazine, but actually sort of set in the universe of the game. It's got ads and articles. It's, it's hilariously awesome. I love all that cheekiness that the point-and-click adventure genre had, particularly back then, you know, late 80s, early 90s, that sort of thing. Definitely a favorite of mine. It's a cool game, too. Although it crashes all the time, at least it did on the computer that I mainly played it on. And that's the thing, a lot of these games are really hard to play on today's machines unless you use emulators like DOSBox, which I would recommend for someone who doesn't want to have to try and go through the trouble of getting themselves a computer that can run it. I actually do have an old IBM PC that I bought, yet again, at a thrift store, which runs Windows 98 and plays a lot of these games without any trouble. Uh, speaking of trouble, this is uh, King's Quest Mask of Eternity, which is the eighth King's Quest game and sort of derailed the series from continuing after that because it was such a departure from the King's Quest everybody knew and loved. Uh, in its own right, if you can get past all the bugs 
and you know without patches almost impassable areas it's not a bad hack and slash kind of RPG adventure game but it's it's not King's Quest also by the creators of King's Quest is Leisure Suit Larry which is uh, <laughs> uh, a very silly series definitely not for for the kids but it's uh it's fun I can't remember how many of the series came in this it was just a, a loose CD-ROM I found I think it's the first four or five games and I think there's only maybe one or two after that that really matter because the past two Leisure Suit Larry games that have come out in history have been, well, pretty bad. Not like the good kind of bad that Leisure Suit Larry's supposed to be, but just terrible games that have nothing to do with Leisure Suit Larry or any of that stuff. And then this is another release of a King's Quest collection. This was released for Windows XP, as it says. Whoop. I gotta move, huh? bumping that all the time. Anyways, uh, it says right here Windows XP, which, you know, was what everybody was asking for at the time because computers couldn't run these games anymore without emulation. And it would have been nice to have an updated version of the games that you didn't need to do that. Uh, of course, as it turns out, as, you know, as, uh, as appreciated as I... As appreciated as this release is, it runs off of the same emulators you can download for free. They just set it up to do it without you having to do the work. But, you know, if it, if it gets you playing King's Quest, absolutely, you know. I'm glad to see that they put something out. And then there's the uh, new King's Quest game, Series 2, which is an episodic series you can get for PC and consoles. Pretty fun so far. I still need to play the third chapter, though. And it's definitely uh, a bit different than past King's Quest games, too. But unlike Mask of Eternity, the, any, the departures they make are acceptable. It still maintains the spirit of King's Quest, which is the most important thing. Mask of Eternity was very dark and kind of gruesome, and King's Quest was never really like that. So, moving on, we have the Mist series. Now, a lot of people aren't into these um, sort of first-person graphical adventures of the era. I, at least a lot of people I've spoken to. Uh, my sister and I are really into the Mist series. Although she often did more of the playing, whereas I would just watch and get immersed in the story. Because there is a story in Myst, but for casual players, they don't always stumble onto just the full extent of the story. How much the story has to offer. Because it's hidden throughout the worlds and journal writings and whatnot. And you sort of have to find yourself, or rather, find the story and find yourself experiencing it slowly. It doesn't give it all to you up at the front. It's one of those games that just kind of drops you in and you have to figure out what to do. And that's uh, off-putting to a lot of people, but uh, I mean, the game speaks for itself, Myst. Most people have heard of it. Um, and I was able to get this complete in the box at the same thrift store that I get most of my stuff. It's the local thrift store chain they have here. And, uh, you know, it's a little dinged up, but I couldn't resist. It's got everything, everything in it. It's pretty neat. And this is a... Uh, a landmark game, as I was saying, it speaks for itself. Whether you love it or hate it, which I happen to love it, Myst certainly changed computer gaming with its arrival in the world of computer games. And it has the disc here. I've got the journal, which is just uh, it's just blank pages, but it's just really snazzy, and I, I just love I love how back in the day, if you bought a game, you weren't just getting the disc; you were getting sort of a presentation. I mean, yeah, you do get all this crap, which is a lot of it's just ads and leaflets and stuff, but it's kind of neat because this has hints in it, uh, which I remember does not really help you that much at all. I'm actually going to hang this up later. It's pretty cool. I've got an extra in here, but it's kind of neat seeing all these old, all these old inserts too, you know, the ad for the novel, the first novel based on the Myst series, which is actually really cool, uh, especially if you're intrigued by the main story of the game and want to know more, it's the backstory of one of the central characters, the main character, I would say, of the Myst series, um, excluding yourself, which they don't really detail the character you're playing because they wanted to be so immersive that it was like you were there, which they kind of, you know, tried to compensate for when they finally went third person in their uh, Myst spin-off Uru, where you could create your own avatar, you know, kind of like... The Sims or whatnot. It was it wasn't quite like The Sims. You had a lot more choices 
than like the early Sims games at least, but the idea was you would try and, and create a close representation of yourself, but it just wasn't quite the same. Uh, I also have boxed the third Myst game, which was uh, the first that was not actually done by the original creators, but it's still a decent game, and it ties into the first one, and you got uh, Brad Dorif playing the villain. Love that guy. He's a lot of fun in this game. But, uh, yeah, that's Exile. So, won't worry about opening that up. It has a lot of the stuff, but not nearly as complete as my copy of Myst. And then least complete would be my copy of the second Myst game, Riven, which is arguably the best in the series, but also without many people arguing with you at all, if you say so, and I do, the hardest Myst game in the series, absolutely. There's one puzzle, for example, which is just awful. And I love, once again, the way they put this together. Uh, when you were buying a game back then, it's almost like you were getting a whole, you know, presentation. It wasn't just the game, the, the box, the inserts. It was all carefully thought out. And I mean, this stuff is just really cool. I love these things. Five discs for Riven. That was a big game for its time. And then Loose, I have a, just an extra Mist. Real Mist, which was they remade the original Mist game, which was all pre-rendered environments. This is actually done with the 3D engine. And you could wander around in real time uh, with better lighting, weather effects, um, and some of the places I think had passage of time too, so it, like the sun would set and rise. And that was just kind of a it was cool, because it made it feel like the world was more alive. But at the same time, there's some things in the pre-rendered imagery from the original version that I actually think look prettier, just because, you know, you're not rendering polygons, they're able to put more detail into the models. But at the same time, it's kind of nice to be able to wander around without, you know, clicking from one still image to another. So it really depends on my mood at the time, which of the versions I like to play. Real Mist, however, is really difficult to get to run on machines a lot of the time and usually in my experience at least requires a lot of patching and stuff just to tweaks and whatnot to get it running all right so let's see i've got a lot more games here um i've got some of my lucas arts ones here unfortunately i don't have any of the lucas arts point and click adventure games uh in an actual like hard copy yet and i really really want to get them i haven't played many of them and that's one thing i still need to uh, knock off my list and, and work on getting through are the uh, LucasArts games like Monkey Island for example I haven't played any of those ever uh, The Dig I've played that but it's been years I wouldn't mind getting that again I do have somewhere an old disc somebody gave me of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis which is really cool and it's a point and click adventure game but Indiana Jones and it's pretty nifty now I'm just going to kind of rapid fire through these because I'm going on already more than I need to <laughs> But I probably will stop and talk in depth about some of the, more of these games because some of them I have some good memories with. So, but anyways, real quick, some games I actually haven't finished, but I'm glad to have them finally. Although I need to get boxes and everything still. Uh, Jedi Knight: Dark Forces 2, which is uh, the first-person shooter set in the Star Wars universe, sequel to the game Dark Forces. Obviously, Dark Forces 2, which I used to have, I don't anymore. I lent it to somebody and I ended up not getting it back before having to move, but. That was a cool game. I wouldn't mind getting again. I actually haven't played this yet, Star Wars Force Commander. Uh, and I haven't done any research, actually, to see which Star Wars game it is, because they did a ton of these around this time. But I'm pretty sure it's a, a strategy game, like an RTS or something to that effect. And then we got Shadows of the Empire, which is one of the coolest Star Wars games, arguably, ever. Although, I can't get this to run on any of my machines. My, uh... Old IBM for older games is not new enough to play, it doesn't have a powerful enough graphics card. And my most recent PC, which I say recent very loosely because it's still got Windows XP, I got it back in uh, 2006, so it's really, really, really dated. But uh, that one is uh, too new still to run it, so it's, it's kind of weird. It, that game required very specific graphics cards to run. I eventually just want to get myself a cartridge of it for the Nintendo 64 because that's the one I really played a lot as a kid anyways and uh, you know it's gonna probably be more stable although I hear with a good graphics card the PC version can look really cool 
Uh, we got Star Wars: The Best of PC. This is a newer, this is a newer release, but it's uh, a compilation of five Star Wars games: uh, Star Wars Empire at War, Star Wars Battlefront, uh, Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast, which is uh, a nifty game that I actually had on the GameCube long before I got this, uh, but I haven't beaten it because you know. Yeah, I suck. Anyways, uh, Star Wars Republic Commandos on there, which was like a squad shooter with like Republic troopers, clone troopers, excuse me. Uh, but the reason I bought this was for Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which is my favorite Star Wars game uh, that I've ever played, and I've played quite a few of them. And uh, I really liked um, The Force Unleashed, too, on console, but uh, that's a story for another time. I also got uh, Knights of the Old Republic 2, which was a cool game, however it suffered from rush development and therefore is not as cohesive as most would like for it to be. It's also quite buggy, but the story that is there is still quite cool. I still would recommend it, but I would recommend the first one over that one. Uh, I've got Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb. This one is almost a Tomb Raider clone. It's a third-person platforming action-adventure game. Although, it's not bad, from what I remember. I got stuck on this one level when I got this years ago, and I never made it past it. I should try it again, though, because I did have a good time playing it. Although, this may be one of those cases where you go back and play a game again after years, and you uh, notice the aging to the point where... It's not as fun, I'm not sure, but I'll have to give that a shot sometime. Uh, love Indiana Jones, so. But I would definitely choose the point-and-click adventure game, Fate of Atlantis, over that one any day of the week. Alright, let's see, real quick, my uh, Elder Scrolls PC games. I have three and four, the fifth one I have only played on console. But I've got uh, Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind in this tiny little box. Which, this was uh, long after the game had already come out. I am a latecomer to the Elder Scrolls games in terms of when I started playing them. I remember when Daggerfall came out, I was just a kid. That's the second one. I really wanted to play it, but I was not allowed to because that game had boobs and whatnot. So, yeah, nudity was uh, not allowed. So, <laughs> I didn't get to play that one when it came out. But I was always intrigued. And not, not because of that, but, you know. That would have been a few more years later when that would have got my attention more. And then, uh, this one is what really turned me into a mega Elder Scrolls fan. Although, like I said, I had played Morrowind before and had had a little bit of fun. It, you know, it, was, it was a cool game, but I never got into it the way I did with Oblivion, which dominated uh, many, many hours of my life when it came out which was forever ago now, and it's kind of crazy to think how long ago it's it's been, like 10 years, crazy. But this is the collector's edition, which I remember I saved up, like, all of my money at the time, because I, I mean, this wasn't too long after the World of Warcraft story I told on the Warcraft 2 retrospective, so, and I bought this, and, uh, yeah, it, it was definitely money well spent. This thing's pretty cool too. It opens up, and the, being the special edition, it's got a uh, really cool booklet in it, which is just filled with history and lore and all that yummy stuff that I I just love, and I love when they put this in video game releases still, which you pretty much need to get like a, a special edition release of any game nowadays to get goodies like that, but you know, it's worth it if you're a collector. It's also got a, a DVD of bonus materials, which is, uh, you know, trailers, I believe there's artwork, uh, behind the scenes making of, which I find really cool. Uh, the disc's not even in there, my wife's been playing it. Uh, which I eat up all of that behind the scenes stuff. Another game that was hugely influential to me is the Baldur's Gate series actually, not just one game, but a series. This being the first Baldur's Gate game, which I got uh, around the time the second game came out actually. Uh, I'm often late to the party with such things, but uh, Baldur's Gate is a Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game set in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, and was definitely, while being a modern game, it felt like it was hearkening back to the glory days of the Goldbox 
Forgotten Realms role-playing games that we used to have on our Commodore 64 uh, computer. I'm really sad we do not own anymore because it would have been very nice to have one of those nowadays, especially with all of this nostalgic computer game uh, feelings, all the feels I've been feeling, feeling feels right now looking at this. Um, the expansion, Baldur's Gate Tales of the Sword Coast, it's, you know, disc is, uh, the case is cracked, obviously it's quite loved. And I don't have my original copy of Baldur's Gate 2 anymore, I ended up giving that away, I think, and the big box just got hammered, because when I was younger, I was stupid and did not take care of things. I wasn't really stupid, but I didn't take care of the boxes, because, you know, they were boxes. Uh, I didn't think I'd want to gather them all together like, you know, a collector. <laughs> Uh, back then. Although, I did collect things back then. I used to have uh, the whole collection of Star Wars Episode One Phantom Menace Pepsi cans. Yeah. Oh, that's epic right there. Okay, so this is Baldur's Gate 2. I was saying it's uh, a collection of Baldur's Gate 2 and its expansion. Baldur's Gate 2, The Throne of Baal. Uh, which uh, is pretty nifty. There's one thing about this release, though, that uh, Bioware actually got some flack about where it has the bonus CD, and they promise weapons, armor, and character portraits, plus the Baldur's Gate soundtrack, which the soundtrack was not on here. And eventually, as an apology, they released all the tracks online for free. Of course, by the time I got this, that link had already expired, because it was for a limited time only. But anyways, Baldur's Gate 2 especially is easily in my top 10 favorite computer or video games of all time. First one I adore as well, but the second one improved upon Baldur's Gate 1 in almost every way possible. Alright, we got some FMV games, which that's full motion video. A lot of these uh, first person adventure games, which were done, you know, kind of like Myst, where they were almost like interactive slideshows, but with video interspersed throughout, gave way to full motion video games where you're interacting heavily with actors who had been uh, shot in front of a blue screen and put into the game. Well, if you want to know more about full motion video games, you should check out mine and Thunder Kitty's Let's Play of the Sierra classic, <laughs> not really classic, but uh, Phantasmagoria, which is a horror game done with full motion video technology. Although, uh, we are not uh, keeping up with that. I'm not sure if we'll get back to it or not, but if you want to get a good idea of FMV games and also be amused for a few hours, definitely check those out. They were uh, fun to do and we may continue eventually. But either way, enjoy if that's what you want to do. We got uh, Frankenstein Through the Eyes of the Monster starring none other than the fantastic and always entertaining Tim Curry who plays Dr. Frankenstein and you are his creation wandering around in a first person FMV world. I don't actually have the original case to this anymore, but it came doubled up in a two-pack. You know, we're talking like just a cheap bargain computer game. Uh, with this one, uh, Mummy, Tomb of the Pharaoh. Now, these had already been out for years and years when I got them. When I got them in the early 2000s at like the grocery store. But I was intrigued, and you know, I found out that, you know, it was worth the six bucks or whatever I spent on it, definitely. I think it was more like twelve, actually, but uh... But this one's cool, too. It's got Malcolm McDowell in it, who is a awesome actor. And I actually beat this one. I got stuck on Frankenstein, but uh, this one's uh, entertaining. You know, it's definitely no masterpiece, but it's a good time waster, definitely. Especially if you're into all that Egyptian stuff. Now, this is one I have not finished, but uh, I could not pass up when I saw it for $2, you know. It's uh, Douglas Adams' Starship Titanic, which is, uh, that should give you an idea that it's going to be a strange adventure just by the name. Uh, Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, co-created this with, I believe it was Terry Jones of Monty Python. So, it's uh, quite amusing and a very unique game from what I've played. I definitely intend on finishing it eventually. Uh, these two, I have no idea if they're any good or what they're like, but I like uh, these puzzle games. So I decided to grab them. This is Riddle of the Sphinx, uh, an Egyptian adventure, an ancient riddle, a deadly curse, an epic challenge. For Windows 98 and 95, and Legacy of Time, uh, which is the Journeyman Project 3, 
Uh, if you guys know anything about these and want to mention it in the comments or email, uh, you know, feel free to let me know. Or, or if any of these other games we're looking at interest you, you want to know more about them, or just want to chat about computer games in general, uh, I would love to hear from you. So I've got a stack here of loose CD-ROM games. I'm just going to try and rapid fire through most of them just so we can get through all of these, but uh, I may talk a little more in depth about some of them. Here we got the uh, classic side-scroller uh, platformer action game Duke Nukem 2 Escape from Alien Abductors. Uh, this is not the Duke Nukem most people think of when they think of Duke Nukem. They think of a first-person shooter, uh, wisecracking, uh, rated M for mature kind of Duke Nukem, definitely. But, you know, one must always celebrate one's roots and a... Uh, Classic side-scrolling platformer is a good thing to have in one's repertoire. This is a fun game, though. A friend of mine, uh, when I was a kid, gave this to me. I feel awful. I can't remember his name right now. But, uh, yeah, I think I may have given him a game or something in trade. I can't remember. But I've had this for years, and I have had trouble getting it to run on my Windows 98 IBM through DOS or whatever. I'm going to try it through DOSBox, but I think it may be... Uh, Worn out, sadly. We shall see. I'll have to check on that. But we have uh, here Duke Nukem 3D. Now this is what we were just talking about. This is this is Duke Nukem, as far as most people, and myself included, are concerned. Uh, first person shooter game. Definitely uh, one that was innovative for its time, for sure. And uh, is, you know, just sort of a, a macho power fantasy. No, it's really cool, though. It's a lot of fun, not for the kids, although I did play the demo of it when I was, I want to say like nine, which is when I was first doing a lot of my PC gaming. The family had just gotten their first computer uh, with a Pentium 166 running Windows 95, and that was when my uh, earliest days of computer gaming really took off. Uh, speaking of, one of the first computer games I ever owned uh, it, depending on who you ask, I was too young to be playing this, but, but, uh, anyways, I digress. Doom 2, which is, uh, speaks for itself, like many of the games in this collection. Doom 2 is the sequel to one of the pioneers, definitely, one of the, the milestones in first-person shooters. Um, really, Doom, the first game in this series, was preceded by Wolfenstein 3D, which I don't have a copy of, although that disc that I first played, that demo of Duke Nukem 3D, actually had a demo of Wolfenstein 3D on it, so I did get to play it that way. But, uh, yeah, I mean, what else can I say? Doom. Doom is awesome. Speaking of Doom, we can, uh, really quick, I might as well pull this out of my, uh, stack of tiny box PC games over here. Doom 3 which, I need to get the first Doom, but it's actually hard to get a, unless you're going to do a digital download type thing, an actual hard copy of the first Doom, because it was a mail only when it came out, which I did not know originally. Um, but it makes sense, the heyday of shareware and all that. Uh, so, the more you learn, which, you know, that's cool. So, this is Doom 3, as I said. It's definitely not like Doom 1 and 2. This one uh, has a greater emphasis on horror, and maybe I would say atmosphere. It's not as fast or as balls to the wall as Doom. It's much more creeping around dark corridors uh, where monsters could jump out at you from the darkness and grab you, that sort of thing. But it's definitely a rush for sure. I never beat this one either. You know, I'm terrible. Uh, uh, you know, I have the problem of starting so many projects, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, last Calivlog talking about D and D and Diablo and stuff. It's the same with games. I, I love gaming so much that. You know, there are, of course I do beat games, but there are a lot of games that I don't finish uh, as other games come along. I guess it's just uh, a matter of preference, or perhaps certain types of games I'm more likely to finish. Uh, but yeah. Uh, SimCity 3000. This is really the SimCity game that I played the most. A lot of people have fond memories of SimCity 2000, uh, even people of my generation, but... I didn't really play 2000 too much. That was one I know my brother played a lot more. I had a friend I borrowed the CD-ROM version of 2000 from, but the disc was so scratched that uh, it was almost unplayable. Got Dungeon Siege here, which is... I don't want to call it a Diablo clone, because that wouldn't be entirely true. It, it definitely still felt like its own thing, but 
it is one that I would recommend to fans of Diablo uh, and other such hack and slash dungeon crawling games. It's definitely uh, heavy on the action, but a lot of fun. I know there's a, couple, a sequel or two for this one, I'm not sure. I never played the sequels, but I definitely enjoyed this one. And I got it at the same time I got Morrowind, but I wound up playing Morrowind more for uh, reasons that'll be obvious to many. Now, I love these things. These I've managed to hold on to for years. These are all shareware discs and uh, demo discs and whatnot. This is my first experience with the first StarCraft. It's the September 1998 CD-ROM that came with uh, issue 170 of, I believe this is Computer Gaming World. So, And it had uh, quite a few demos and things on here that I found quite enjoyable. Um, but it is my first experience with StarCraft, so I'm sure that says a lot. And then, you know, just some other random ones I got here from much later on when I got my desktop that I do a lot of my gaming on. This is a game that I have never purchased the full version to, but I played the hell out of this demo, and I definitely want to get the full version one day to play around with, maybe even do a video. Uh, Evil Genius. It's a simulation game. Uh, but you're basically playing a, almost like a James Bond villain or like a Dr. Evil type character and you're running your your evil base and you have these different henchmen and you have to stop uh, attacks from like secret agencies and stuff. It's uh, very amusing. And then this came with that first family computer I was talking about, that Pentium 166. Uh, Zodiac 50 Game Pack Volume 2, and it's just a disc of uh, different f demos and shareware uh, for Windows 95, and this is actually uh, has a demo of the first Doom, which to this day is actually the only uh, Doom 1 that I have played, I'm ashamed to say. But uh, a lot of memories on this disc. Now this is a game that does not belong to me technically. This is Star Trek The Next Generation of Final Unity, which is a point-and-click adventure game, uh, but set in the Star Trek The Next Generation universe. It is really nifty um, to play as, you know, the crew of the Enterprise D, but it's it plays very similar to what I recall to, you know, the other point-and-click adventure games. Uh, this is by Spectrum Holobyte. I'm sure they've done some other point-and-click adventure games, but I haven't played any more of theirs to my knowledge. But this game belongs to the son of my 5th and 6th grade school teacher, and uh, he lent it to me, and we moved from that state, and somehow, you know, somehow, it sounds like I did it on purpose, but no, I actually meant to get this back to him, but it got packed with the rest of my stuff when we were all hurrying to get our stuff together so we could move, because we had to be out by a certain time, and uh, I did not get it back to him, and I don't have a way to reach him. I have lost his contact information, but I should try and dig up at least his old email address from the school. Maybe he still teaches there. Uh, yeah, you know, shout out to you, uh, Ken Rubin, the best uh, school teacher I've ever had. Uh, my, you know, I liken him to Yoda in terms of uh, the wisdom that he passed on to me as a youngster, as a teacher. Awesome, awesome guy. So, I'd like to know how he's doing. Now we have... Uh, Microsoft Kids 3D Movie Maker. Um, anyone who knows me well knows uh, exactly what this is because it became the uh, the focus of most of my free time. Probably, I think it's from the ages of like 12 to 14, something like that. I can't remember, but I used to, you know, and even later for a while, I was playing with this thing non-stop, uh, making all sorts of different movies and, and projects, many of them which I didn't finish, of course. So, it's, you know, definitely dated and does not look that great, and the Flash community definitely was, uh, something that, uh, was sort of counter to this, but there was a huge community online for Microsoft 3D Movie Maker, most of them not even kids, this is Microsoft Kids, but well, you know, they were kids. They didn't seem like kids to me at the time because, you know, I was just a teenager. They were, you know, a bunch of angry internet teenagers. And, you know, I'm not speaking for all of the 3D Movie Maker community, but a lot of the people in that community online 
were terrible, just like the most mean-spirited uh, bunch of jerks. No offense to, you know, some of you who aren't and played with this program. Which I, I knew a couple, but it was my first experience with internet trolls and that really even being a thing before I even knew the term troll for it. It was just, uh, but a lot of fun. Definitely an amusing program. Uh, this is another amusing program, uh, The Simpsons Cartoon Studio. This is a little bit older, I think originally made for 486s. But uh, this is a lot of fun too. It's almost like little comic strip animations. They're not as in depth as the th or uh, detailed as the things you can do in 3D Movie Maker, but it's The Simpsons. And uh, I used to make some amusing little shorts. Uh, I always intended on showing these before my other movies I would make in 3D Movie Maker, kind of like how you'd have an animated short or something before a movie would play in a theater, because I used to go all out with that sort of thing, and plan like, you know, when I'd finish a movie, we'd do the popcorn and, you know, all that stuff. But, uh, this is a lot of fun. Gives you, uh, the option to export your videos as well and, and play them outside the program, which, uh, from what I recall, you could not do with 3D Movie Maker, so that was nice that they actually let you export. Uh, we got Army Men franchise, really, in the early 2000s. They were everywhere. Um, and the cool thing about most of the Army Men games, it was almost like Toy Story, where you were playing as actual Army Men figures uh, in the real world, so you had that scale difference. But this one, I distinctly remember, even though you're Army Men, it was just, you know, like normal out in the battlefield, you know, the scale was just, you know, they didn't feel like toys as much as just, you know, little green men, but, uh, you know, I guess that's how, you know, it is when you're a kid and you're using your imagination with them too, so, you know, whichever you prefer, but I prefer the, the more Toy Story way for sure. This one I think used to belong to my brother, or even my cousin, I'm not sure, I've had it in my collection for years and I've never been able to get it to run. Um, you know, World War II plane game, basically, an air combat simulation, which, you know, I had terrible luck, even as a kid, getting these flight sims to even run. So maybe we just didn't have the right computer for it. Maybe I just have bad luck. But when I would, I was terrible at them anyways. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, one where you go up against Nazis and stuff. So, so maybe I can get it to run eventually on the IBM. Uh, you know, maybe through DOSBox or something. I'm not sure. Uh, well, not on the IBM, not not with DOSBox, but um, one or the other, hopefully. I just haven't tried to get it to work in a long time. So maybe, you know, we can get it running sometime, but uh, I probably would suck at it. <laughs> not very good at flight sims. Uh, Mortal Kombat 4. Now, I was major into Mortal Kombat as a kid. Definitely a, a product of the 90s there. And this was the only way I could play Mortal Kombat 4 when it came out, because that, that was before I had a, a Nintendo 64, which was the console I chose when I had the choice, you know, between N64 or a PS1. Maybe, you know, it's debatable which would have been the wiser decision. Uh, I actually have access to both now, but uh, the merits of both systems is the topic for another video as well. But yeah, Mortal Kombat 4, not really one of the best Mortal Kombat games anyways. It was their first attempt at transitioning into 3D, uh, which worked for it and against it, I think, in some respects, as far as that game goes. But it's definitely, uh, I wouldn't say, as cheesy as a Mortal Kombat friendship, you know, finishing move would be, in terms of just overall cheesiness, because I always thought those were kind of dumb, since they went against the whole kind of point of the first Mortal Kombat game, which was just supposed to be gritty and and, you know, violent and all that stuff. But anyways, the point I'm trying to make is the game itself feels very cheesy. Um, and they definitely got better when they continued the series later on. Like, uh, I never played Mortal Kombat Deception. No, it was Deadly Alliance I never played. I did play Deception, and Deception is fantastic as far as I'm concerned. More games I haven't really played much, but I'm sure there are those who would tell me I need to. The Lords of Magic and Lords 2, Lords of the Realm by Sierra, I believe they are strategy games. Um, I don't think they're RTSs though, I'm going to have to look into that. But it's more games that I haven't gotten around to actually playing much. But, you know, it's Sierra, and I'm glad to have it. Another uh, Sierra game, although I'm not sure if this was actually done by Sierra or just published, I couldn't get this to run on either of my computers. It's Lost in Time. 
He plotted your doom centuries before you were born. It looked really cool, you know, m you know, at least the case made me think of, you know, kind of a, an adventure, you know, well, yeah, it, it, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I love uh, time travel in anything, so I was intrigued. I mean, you know, you got the you got the Sphinx there, not Sphinx, but uh, the the Pharaoh head, and you got this guy who is running from something. He looks like he's freaking out. Uh, you know, you have the chick who kind of looks like uh, she almost looks like a uh, Agent Peggy Carter or something. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to look into that. If you guys know anything about that, please let me know. Uh, this one, uh, another thrift store find, Scooby Doo Mystery the. Fun Park Phantom. We got this to run on the IBM. My son and I were playing around with it, but it ran really slow. Uh, too slow for my liking, so I'm hoping that maybe I can get this to run on my uh, XP machine. It might run better, but I love Scooby-Doo. It's kind of a adventure uh, puzzle. Not really a puzzle game. It's not really a mystery game, either. I mean, you're, you're going around picking up, like, these clues and whatnot and collecting them to solve the mystery, but it doesn't feel very sleuthy. It's, it's much more like a board game, which is nothing wrong with that. I love, you know, mystery board games. Clue is one of my favorite board games of all time. In fact, it is my favorite board game. More random CD-ROMs here. We got Magic School Bus uh, games, which these were a lot of fun for me when I was a little one, especially the space one, which I don't have yet, but I need to get. Uh, Magic School Bus explores the world of animals. Magic School Bus explores the rainforest. Oh, and speaking of Clue, yeah, here we are. We got Clue right here. This is a uh, PC version of the board game. It plays like the board game, too, although it uses sort of an isometric, uh, you know, almost, I don't know if they're actual 3D graphics, if they're pre-rendered, but you actually see, yeah, it's really hard to see from here, but you actually would see the characters, like, walking around the mansion rather than just little board game pieces. Uh, runs extremely slow on my IBM but runs okay on my Windows XP machine, actually. But it's definitely not my favorite way to play the board game. It kind of handles a little awkwardly, I guess. A little gimmicky. They do, like, little, like, pre-rendered video cutscenes and stuff for the murders, and when you're in a room and trying to uh, solve a murder or, you know, make your guess, it'll show what you're saying you guess might have happened in that room. So that's kind of neat. We got uh, the game Dragon's Lair. Most people know what Dragon's Lair is and just how unforgiving this game is. I can't make it even on this computer version past the first damn room. But it's Dragon's Lair, and it looks awesome. I love Don Bluth and his animation style. Even if I could never beat this game myself, how can I not get Dragon's Lair on CD-ROM, you know, for a buck? I had to say yes. It's Dragon's Lair. This one I don't even think has the full insert. I haven't tried it yet. It's some sort of uh, the Muppets CD-ROM, Muppets Inside. So there are Muppets Inside, and it runs for Windows 95. I haven't tried it yet, but I love the Muppets. I love old Windows 95 CD-ROMs. I don't know if it's a game or uh, if it's like an interactive thing. You know, I'm not sure what it is. We'll have to check it out sometime. Wizardry. Crusaders of the Dark Savant. This is, I think, Wizardry 5. Uh, this one was a pain in the butt for me to get to run back when I got it for like $5 at Walmart when I was 10 or 9. Because um, we had the first Wizardry game on Super Nintendo, and it was cheap, and I love RPGs, so I decided to get it. Uh, it's really hard to get to run, though. It requires uh, one of those copy protection, like, decoder things, and which... I think comes on the CD-ROM for you to reference, but just getting it to run was a nightmare at the time. But it runs on DOS, I believe, which I've gotten better at getting things to run on DOS. But from what I recall, it, it was fun, uh, especially I can understand maybe Die Hard Wizardry fans like it, but it, I've definitely played RPGs I prefer, even from that time period. Another game I haven't played, we've had in my collection, I think this was inherited from either my cousin or my brother, Stellar 7. Uh, I think my brother got it with a 486 that my cousin gave him. Uh, I don't know what kind of game this is, but I have never been able to get it to run for whatever reason. We've got Descent, Destination's Turn. This is a really cool game. 
I'm not even sure if I can get this to run on either of my current machines. Probably my actually uh, XP machine because this takes uh, a 3D card of some sort, I believe. Uh, uses, I think, one of the earlier 3D sort of uh, spaceship games. Uh, not quite a normal spaceship game, but like a 3D shooter almost in a ship. I haven't played it in years though, but it's uh, pretty cool. And I got it to run on the computer we had uh, at the time I acquired this, but I haven't tried to get it to run, you know, in over a decade. So uh, another game that I got when uh, around the time that we had a, uh, a new 3D card installed in our first family PC. Uh, you know, a racing game. I'm never usually into these racing games too much, but sometimes the mood will strike me. I'm not very good at racing games, I'll admit. So, but uh, I mean, one of my favorite racing games I used to play was actually a really old one on the Commodore 64. It was the Commodore 64 version of Test Drive 2, the Duel. That was a fun game. Required a lot of disc switching, though. Deadlock Planetary Conquest. I believe this is a strategy game. Uh, I haven't played this one either, but, you know, Planetary Conquest, that sounds kind of cool. So, if it's some sort of a space strategy game, I would give that uh, further investigation. Like I said, these ones, like, there's a lot of games in here I just haven't played. Uh, these are sort of just the extra ones I've gotten, people have given to me, or... Uh, there's been other cases where I would uh, trade games with someone, like I'd borrow games of theirs, they borrow games of mine, and then we would just never get them back from them, or they never, you know, uh, contact is lost, and you never get your games back, and they never get theirs back. Or things are accidentally packed when you move, or whatever, but yeah, so. Rambling, rambling, rambling. I said I was going to rapid fire through these, but I lied. So, uh, Crusader No Regret. This intrigued me when I first saw it as a kid. It looked like a red Boba Fett, almost. Uh, but, once again, this is another game I could never get to run. So, I could probably get it to run now, though. Uh, through, you know, even if I have to use some compatibility settings. There's usually, nowadays, it's even, you know, you just have to go through the trouble of doing it. But, there's usually patches, uh, fixes, cracks, whatever, to get old games running. But, sometimes, I find it's almost not worth the trouble. It just depends on how badly you want to play that game, you know. Getting close to finishing, I want to look at my uh, Blizzard games for a minute now. I am sad to say I don't have a lot of, you know, my boxes anymore, um, which is just really sad. Or some of the inserts, like uh, Warcraft 1, for example, I don't have the CD insert for it anymore. Or uh, the original box. Of course, I got the battle chest, uh, which I have another battle chest down here for Diablo, which we'll look at in a second. But the battle chest at the time was just uh, Warcraft 1 and 2, and then the expansion to 2, all in one set. I still do have the insert to my expansion for Warcraft 2, but uh, I'm just having Warcraft 2 and its expansion uh, doubling up in the same case for now. Because, uh, you know, I've lost cases over the years, too, or uh, you'll notice a lot of these I've shown don't have uh, the inserts actually in them or on the back or whatever it's because those are transplanted cases or I never had the case to begin with which is the case huh. I'm saying case a lot well but that is the case with uh, a lot of the older games they were just given to me loose or just in a random CD case or whatever so StarCraft which uh, is my first full copy of StarCraft I actually owned which is uh, was given to me by a good friend and uh, we have the expansion here, which I don't know where the insert is to the regular StarCraft Tour. I don't even have it anymore. But uh, Brood War is a really cool expansion. Uh, I know it's my wife's personal favorite because, you know, you have her. And she's just awesome. Okay, this isn't Blizzard. I just have it stacked in there because it's another uh, real-time strategy series. We have the Westwood's Command & Conquer Red Alert 2. And I haven't played these either, but I have been considering, or not really considering, but actually planning on trying to give them a go fairly soon. Because I've heard about these games, you know, since I was uh, nine years old. I had a friend in elementary school who uh, talked about Red Alert all the time. And I'm not even sure if I have all the discs or not. I hope I do. If not, I will make sure to get the rest of them so I can play, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, my uh, cousin actually gave me those. A different cousin than the one I mentioned before. But... Aha. Now, 
one of my favorite role-playing games ever, the first Diablo. Uh, I actually have a couple of copies of this, because I have this one, which was actually from the original release for Windows 95. And then I also have, included in the Diablo Battle Chest with Diablo 2, another copy of the first Diablo game. So I actually have more than one, which I don't mind, because it's good to have extras. And I believe this one might be, have been updated to run on, uh, you know, XP machines and around that kind of time frame. But uh, yeah, Diablo and Diablo 2... Uh, probably my most favorite hack and slash role playing experiences easily. And then I also have here the expansion to Diablo, which was an authorized expansion developed by Sierra, or, you know, of all people. It looks like uh, Synergistic Software also had a hand in it. I'm not sure which of the two actually did the, the bulk of the work, but, you know, for being authorized, uh, you know, it was, the quality was pretty good. Uh, a lot of uh, games back then had unauthorized uh, expansions and whatnot, too. Usually shooters like uh, Duke Nukem Doom and everything. But uh, it was pretty cool. They gave you the Monk class, which was a welcome addition, and a whole new uh, set of dungeons, or uh, whatever you want to call them, which were like uh, insect hives. And they were really hard, if I remember correctly. Got some more thrift store finds here. This is... Uh, a classic adventure game which I have played but I haven't finished it and I haven't even made it that far but I want to because the whole design and just feel of this game is just it's it's wonderful it's it's really cool kind of a steampunky kind of thing but not exactly it's, it's kind of you know it's just really neat um, but I, I need to finish this and I hear the sequel is good too and I Siberia I think that's how it's pronounced but I have two copies, a loose disc that I had found, and then uh, in a small box, because this is actually a more recent-ish game. I say more recent-ish as in, like, you know, it was in the 2000s, so, <laughs> you know, recent with quotations. But uh, recent enough to have a small box. Discover and explore worlds of unparalleled beauty and charm on an endless journey across time. <laughs> so, this looks like something that is definitely right up my alley. So I know when I finally get around to sitting down to truly give some time to this, I'm going to have a good time playing it, for sure. Uh, here we go, another one released by the Adventure Company. Uh, it's also a, sort of a point-and-click adventure game, and I've had trouble getting it to run on my more recent computer, but on my XP machine this runs just fine. Uh, strangely enough, for a game of its uh, the year it came out, it doesn't play in like widescreen. It's still in the old box-like shaped display, no matter how high the resolution can be cranked up. That's kind of sad because I would think the atmosphere in this would be really nice, you know, to fill up the whole screen. But yeah, Dracula Origin, which is a Victorian uh, sort of horror point-and-click adventure game, so it's definitely one I would consider covering more in the future so uh, a lot of these games you know have a they don't they're, they're not very big in terms of the following they have nowadays I mean this is 2008 it looks like is when the date is on here but uh, adventure games have sort of started to make a comeback thanks to people like Telltale um, the odd gentleman uh, with their King's Quest game you know a whole bunch of others too uh, one of my favorite being a uh, Phoenix Online Studios, they sort of got their big start with uh, a fan sequel to the King's Quest series, and they've gone off to do their own stuff, which is really good, and I'm considering covering some of their stuff in the future. But uh, we're down to our last little stack here of some of my other small box computer games. These are much newer, you know, post-DOS era games now, all of them. Uh, Warcraft 3, which I actually don't have the disc right now. I may need to get a new one. I'm not sure, but uh, I just need to find one that has a, a key that I can still use on it. But Warcraft 3 is awesome. Uh, you know, It's another one of those games that speaks for itself. Uh, Warcraft 2 is still my personal favorite for nostalgic reasons, but in truth, I will acknowledge this game is superior. It has a lot more choices for different races. You have more than two now. You have a whole bunch. Uh, the story is definitely more in-depth and fleshed out. The cutscenes are beautiful. Uh, just a really fun, really cool game. 
another strategy game that I enjoyed but found kind of disappointing was the Battle for Middle Earth. Now it's not really a bad game, uh, so I shouldn't say disappointing. It's I can't remember which uh, RTS this is done heavily in the style of, and it's just a different way of doing things than like Warcraft Age of Empires. You're really limited on where you can place your structures and buildings and things, but you know, for its time it looked great and I was still riding high on the Lord of the Rings trilogy at that point, you know, when, I'm, when am I not, even now. But, uh, you know, I had this cool, like, interactive map of Middle-earth in the game and all these different scenarios. I had a few voices from the movies. Uh, I know Billy Boyd, who plays Pippin, actually did Pippin's voice in the game. I think a couple of other people, too. A lot of the other voices were just uh, uh, sound-alikes, though. But, you know, as far as a, a strategy game set in Middle-earth goes, based off the movies, I had a lot of fun with it. Although I hear Battle for Middle-earth 2 improved on a lot of this one's flaws, so I wouldn't mind checking that out sometime. I know my uh, Windows XP computer actually struggles to run that one sometimes with all the settings turned up. So, uh, speaking of uh, a game that my computer struggles to run with all the settings turned up, because I just don't have a new computer... Although, actually, I think my laptop runs it better now. Is uh, Lost Via Domus, which is the Lost tie-in game. Uh, as I said forever ago when I was talking about licensed games in my uh, King Kong Collection video, licensed games are hit and miss. They're usually miss. I feel like this game falls somewhere in the middle. I think I would have had an easier time playing this on a console with a controller. And they tried to make it tie into the series and sort of feel canon. I think they considered it canon for a while and then I think they went back on that and changed their mind. So, you know, not a masterpiece, but if you are a die-hard Lost fan, it's definitely worth checking out. Although, speaking of sound-alikes, uh, most of the voice actors in this are sound-alikes and for a good few of the characters from what I recall, I use the term sound-alike very loosely. Uh, one of my favorite simulation games ever is the movies, which, uh, you know, it's kind of like The Sims, but, you know, you're not running a, the life of a sim or in a household or whatever. This, this whole thing, as you can probably guess, uh, is about making movies, and you are a movie studio mogul, and you're basically running a movie studio simulation where you have to uh, manage your stars and, you know, build the buildings, the sets. You actually get to create your own films. There's uh, quite a few options for actually editing the films. Um, you know, you hire actors and directors, and it, it's just... Well, I could go on and on. I mean, I could do a whole video about this. And I'm actually considering uh, at least doing sort of a, a Let's Play one or two shot where Calablade, you know, moi, is playing the game. Uh, and the game was improved exponentially by the release of its expansion, the movies, stunts, and effects. Uh, this gives you a lot more camera control over the movies you're making in the game, includes a whole bunch of other scenes and costumes, and just... It, it is definitely a must-have. I, I don't even like playing the game without it installed anymore, just because this is so much cooler, uh, what they've given you in this, to include in the game. Now we have the one MMO I actually bought, and that's Guild Wars which is, you know, a well-known uh, MMO game. I mentioned in the Warcraft review when I was talking about World of Warcraft how I never really got into MMOs, although I did try uh, with Guild Wars, and I actually ended up playing more uh, Lord of the Rings Online years later, but I still never got huge into them like some people are. Uh, and this game was fun, you know, it, it, it was a free-to-play, uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing game, which they hadn't really done at the time. Uh, the catch was you just had to buy the game, you know, at the store, but the actual, you didn't have to pay a monthly subscription to play, like World of Warcraft, EverQuest, uh, Ultima Online, etc., etc., which, uh, I remember when I first heard about Ultima Online and the concept of playing a game online like that, it just blew my mind. Uh, I wish I could have played that, but, you know, hackers and other players broke the game, uh, from what I understand, by assassinating the creator of the game who had his own version of himself in it and yeah anyways um, I'm going off topic again uh, Guild Wars was cool 
but I was basically settling for Guild Wars because, like I said, I wasn't able to get World of Warcraft because my parents wouldn't help me pay the monthly fee, so I got Guild Wars. And while it was cool and I enjoyed it, it's not what I really wanted. Uh, now we have Sid Meier's Pirates Live the Life. This is a remake of one of my favorite, favorite old-school retro computer games, Sid Meier's Pirates, which I fell in love with on the Commodore 64, and then when I... Uh, got the PC version and played that on our family's Pentium 1. It only reaffirmed my my love affair with Pirates. This remake is pretty good. Um, I wouldn't call it as good. There's something about it that felt slightly off, but it definitely sated my appetite for some scurvy pirateness. And uh, it's a fun game, you know. You're sailing the seas and you're finding treasure and and you're, you know, you're being a pirate and doing all the great things that... Uh, you know, depending on who you ask, that pirates do. This one tried to put a, more of a story into it than the other ones, which was much more open-ended. And while it was kind of cool, you're, the way you end the game, you know, there's, there's various ways you can win or fail at this um, as a pirate. It's got a lot of replay value in that respect. But I distinctly recall in the original Pirates game, since there was not one main story, the different endings, uh, when you lose, or win, you know, or retire, your pirate could go on to do more things, I think, than your pirate was able to in the remake version. Because, you know, it all had to tie into the story, whereas in the other one, it was sort of uh, more and more unique uh, endings. But it was all done in text, so I mean, it depends on uh, what you're wanting to get from it. And that's all I have for now, folks. Hope I didn't bore you too much and that you found my ramblings and anecdotes entertaining. Please subscribe to Calablade the Geek for more, and thank you and greetings to our new subscribers. Notice there's been a few since the last upload. Until next time, thank you for joining us on Calavlogs.